Religious and racial intolerance is an issue that the world is grappling with. More frequently, intolerance has shown violent manifestations in one way or another. And an example closer to home is what happened in Christchurch a few days ago. Tonight we examine intolerance and its root causes. We'll discuss the term Islamophobia and shed some light on Islam around the world. We speak first with Reverend James Bhagwan and Mr. Nazimuddin, together with Mr. Rajender Prasad from the University of the South Pacific, who all represent their various faiths. And later on, we'll, we'll have Mr. Ashwin Raj of the Anti-Discrimination and Human Rights Commission. Gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the show. Thank good evening. You for Thank us. you for having us. Uh, first to uh, Mr. Nazimuddin. And um, before I go on any further, I feel that it's very important for us to uh, make some clarifications that no, none of our guests are representing their religious uh, organizations, mm -hmm. but just uh, as members of their own religious mm -hmm. communities. So a lot's been said about Christchurch, and everyone knows what happened. We all know how the world has responded as well. Mr. Nazim, do you think that the person who perpetrated these acts in Christchurch has achieved his uh, objectives that he set out to achieve? Well, as far as his uh, objectives of uh, taking lives are concerned, uh, specifically, he uh, was successful in taking those lives. But on a general scale, what he wished to do was to wedge that, um, uh, to, to wield uh, a sense of division among the communities. I believe that he could not, he did not achieve because uh, I think it backfired, whatever he did. It actually brought the, all the communities together. It, not, not only the communities in, in, in New Zealand, but uh, I'm uh, really astounded to see the global response in this regard. It was uh, really amazing that people came forward and you know, in, 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 in solidarity, because uh, there were uh, innocent people being uh, slaughtered like that is, 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 is simply condemnable. I mean, not just from a religious point of view, but from a point of view uh, of, of, of uh, humanity entirely. I mean, that is really, uh, for the, I mean, as far as that is concerned, yes, he was not able to achieve his objectives. Now, Reverend, um, we spoke about intolerance at the beginning of the show. Do you think that intolerance is something that uh, is a growing issue in the world and in your own church community? Do you see it as an issue that we have in Fiji? Well, I think um, when we talk about the issue of intolerance, it goes beyond just uh, religious intolerance. It is a, it's an attitude that, that people develop when they focus only on their own perspectives and uh, refuse to recognize other people, uh, the differences that we have. Um, you know, uh, in the Christian community, one of the, the lessons that we find in all the Abrahamic faiths, that's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, you have the, the command in, in the Old Testament, so it's in all the faiths, is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and so the recognition of loving, loving the other is, is part of what faith is about. Unfortunately, we live in a world where uh, many things divide us. Um, and where um, society also plays on those divisions. And so we need to find ways in which we can address those divisions and recognize that um, intolerance uh, is, is, is a perception of looking at people differently without looking at them as fellow human beings. And I think that's the, the key for us, to recognize the humanity that we share and start from that. Looking at something that a lot of people don't really give two thoughts about is thoughtless comments and the, their own personal agenda that they sort of carry forward with misinterpretations of the scriptures. Could you tell us if there are any scriptures that specifically say that intolerance or you know intolerance towards those who are not followers of Christianity is something that is acceptable well, as I've just said you know the the main gospel the main story of the gospel the crux of the matter is love God's love in the Christian tradition God's love for us our love for God as demonstrated through love for others and in the Christian tradition uh, Jesus sets the example of what is the other and he defines our neighbor and the other as the least among us 
um, the the Old Testament again going back to the Abrahamic faiths it's about caring for the migrant caring for the widow caring for the orphan caring for the person who is different from you and in the New Testament in the gospel for the Christian tradition Jesus is active in doing that for the, he has a preferential option for women in a place in a time and place where women had no rights at all he uh, you know reached out to those who were considered outcasts in society and that is the that is supposed to be the norm for Christianity what happens however is that in the context of um, uh, the different uh, communities that we belong to, people take advantage of that, our, our differences. And in the past, uh, using our differences has been a way to, to gain popularity. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes an us and them. Mm -hmm. So we tend to look at our differences rather than what, um, what unites us, what we have in common. Mm -hmm. We tend to look at uniformity rather than unity and diversity. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is where we start to have the, the dangerous issues come up. Yes, we are different people. We're all different. We're all different in our ethnic makeup, in our culture, in our faith. But as um, you know, um, the Imam who spoke at the um, the uh, prayers last Sunday at um, in Makoy at the uh, the vigil there said, "If you cut our skin, all the blood is the same." Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's that's a very th important thing for us to remember. Mm -hmm. Mr. Oh, Mr. Dean, um, some of the things that the Reverend just said, uh, I'm sure you'd agree that Islam also teaches most of those, if not all of those, ideals. Why is it that then uh, Islam uh, attracts so much uh, negativity and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, or hatred? Mm -hmm. Let's say apprehension. Apprehension. All right. Um, well, first of all, uh, let me put this on record. Uh, Islam is a very misinterpreted religion, mm -hmm. not just by the non-Muslims, but by the Muslims as well. It's because of the lack of understanding about your own religion. The people are not reading about it, right? I mean, if you have to know about a particular religion, you have to go to the original sources, the, the, the original scriptures of a religion, in order to know what's actually in there. Right, so I believe these things have been overlooked for a very long time. I mean, it's not new; it's not something new. It, it has been there for for ages that people have been neglecting it. So it it it, it, it also goes uh, with the Muslims as well. Having said that, I mean, I am o I have come over here not uh, to uh, um, justify any actions of a Muslim. Right, I. I'm here to uh, talk about the Quran, specifically what are the injunctions in it, which deals with these particular issues. In the Quran, it's mentioned in crystal clear words, in, uh, in uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 32, that if anyone slew an innocent life, an innocent being, right, uh, and um, uh, except for, uh, 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 if it is for murder, or for creating mischief in the land, then it's as if he has taken the, the life of whole of humanity. And if he saves, anyone saves an, an innocent life, it's as if he has, uh, he, he has saved the whole of humanity. I mean, that's a very strong, unequivocal statement from the Quran, from the, God, uh, from the Word of God, that is explicitly clear. Plus, now, coming to the other side, I know there are, there, are, there, are, there are many instances in the Quran talking about such rhetoric which has been misconstrued and mis in, misinterpreted by <coughs> not, not, not just the Muslims, uh, but uh, I mean uh, the terrorist or extremist elements are also quoting the Quran. Mm -hmm. all right? And uh, the reason being that uh, is the lack of understanding in terms of that many, many uh, uh, verses are taken out of context. When you quote something out of context, you're actually making your own interpretation because you want to achieve your particular objective, your particular agenda, whatever it is, all right? And you're trying to justify it just by taking certain elements from it and, 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 and proving your point of view. That is not uh, at all acceptable. In chapter uh, 60, verse number 8, it's explicitly clear as well in the Holy Quran that any non-Muslim, any non-Muslim, any unbeliever, in that sense, that any non-Muslim 
who uh, is a pacifist and who hasn't uh, who who hasn't got anything to do with war or anything to do uh, uh, with, uh, with 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 any uh, violence to the Muslims, right? They must not. The Muslims must not declare war on them. Under no circumstances is it uh, is it allowed. It is absolutely forbidden. But I don't know what particular verses of the Quran these, these people are, are quoting, and, 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 it's, and it's also uh, to a wider extent in the international media. It's basically an institutional, what I call it is institutionalized bigotry, which has been picked on from, from, from certain uh, um, uh, uh, political platforms as well, and the media also plays in uh, hand in hand. They're equally complicit in, in, in disseminating this, this type of hate speech. Mm -hmm. And right, because all these whatever happened in Christ, it, it it started from somewhere. It started from hate speech. It started it, it started from, from 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 all those racist comments that, that, that those political uh, agendas are trying to feed on. Mm -hmm. And this this is the major issue that we should actually combat mm -hmm. over here in in the in the South Pacific and anywhere in the world. We should we should concentrate on 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 those things that actually make us right. human. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Thank you. When we come back from the break, we'll examine the concept of jihad. Reverend Bhagwan, I thought that we should address the, this issue. It's quite rampant in Fiji, where you have people of certain faiths, especially looking at the Christian community, where they take things that are in the Bible, scriptures, and they translate it or they interpret it verbatim, word for word, literally, and they try to action it, which sort of does not necessarily go with the church's values. What do you say to that? How do you combat that? Yeah, um, the challenge is uh, in how we interpret the scriptures. Um, the the technique of interpreting the scriptures is what we call biblical exegesis. How do you exegete? How do you draw out from the from the scriptures what it is you you are reflecting on? Um, and the challenge lies within the fact that for a lot of the the Old Testament, there are stories in that which relate of the people of God, uh, people of Israel, etc their journey of formation, the mistakes that they make, uh, what happens, how God intervenes in their lives. And um, there's quite a lot of wrath and anger. In well, all of yes, that there that is in, in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And um, this is sometimes what happens. We tend to draw on the passages, as we heard earlier, uh, on, on the passages that uh, we want to use. And this is, this is a dangerous thing of um, what we call either literalism, mm -hmm fundamentalism um, what we try to do uh, as um, you know religious studies have been ongoing over the last especially in the 20, 20th century and into the 21st century looking at the context trying to unpack the scriptures now the misinterpretation of the Bible does not just lead to issues of racial intolerance it leads to gender equality it leads to discrimination against uh, um, race religion gender abilities um, and so what we try to do is help with the understanding by understanding the social context, especially in terms of uh, reminding people that for Christians it's the message of Christ, uh, the Gospels in which he teaches and he tells us the way to live. So those things are very important to just focus purely on the Old Testament, purely on the, um, the epistles without recognizing what Jesus is saying in the context of everything. And again, the message of love, um, unconditional love. Um, is, is a challenge for us. But, you know, um, we, we need to also think about what are the underlying factors. Radicalism uh, and radical ideologies uh, grow and flourish in spaces where people feel that um, they are hard done by. Mm -hmm. So where there is economic injustice, where there is um, uh, a lack of quality education that helps people uh, understand the deeper meanings and able to have a critical analysis, a critical way of thinking. Mm -hmm. These are the challenges. And when people go through difficult times, economically, with jobs, whatever, they tend to turn around and look to see who to blame. Mm -hmm. And when you, if you're in that mindset, uh, you pick up something to read, that actually can feed that mindset and that's 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 how radicalism starts to starts to take place and then of course 
that leads into people with political agendas. Um, the challenge is, of course, in a context like Fiji, where we are um, uh, a multi-faith community, a multi-ethnic community, but also in the context of being a secular state. How do we create spaces mm -hmm. for us to engage in, in expressing our faith uh, in, in, a, in, in discourse? Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that we need to, to consider as well. But bringing it back to the congregation, how do you hear the congregation to sort of remind them that not necessarily everything that they read is as is? You know, do they consult with members of your, your um, the church, pastors, preachers? Absolutely. Well, this is uh, one of the key things then, is theological training. Mm -hmm. The question we ask is, uh, are the people who are teaching and preaching, are they trained? Do they have an understanding of the scriptures? So, so one may counter that with saying that I have faith, and therefore, if I have faith, then yeah, I have faith. Yeah, faith is great. And the Bible can be a wonderful tool for encouragement for hard times. We pick up, we read the Psalms for encouragement. We read the stories just as we tell. But if you want to go into the deeper, deeper innings, and this is where many of the mainline churches are insisting we, that's why we have theological education. Mm -hmm. We train our ministers. We train them not only on the biblical and theological training, but pastoral care in various contexts mm -hmm. and situations. And so uh, many churches, uh, many theological institutions are now trying to address a lot of the, the rapid changing in our society that's mm -hmm. going on. How do we cater for the, this, the millennials? How do we reach out to them? Not just in terms of uh, uh, you know, conversion and things like that, but how do we teach them the gospel? How do we ex help mm -hmm. them be good human beings? Meaning, how do you, how you, if you're a good Christian, you're also a good human being. Mm -hmm. So that is the challenge for us. And at the same time, we have those who say, no, you don't need that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, um, I, I, I'm powerful enough to interpret the scripture. Mm -hmm. But if there is no reference point, right, if there is no reference point, that becomes very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And this is how extre extremism, extremism can, can begin. Mm -hmm. Because people, by the force of their charisma, not by the, their expertise, not by their training, but just by force of charisma can convince people that their interpretation is the correct one. And when people counter with saying that's not the mainstream, then they say, no, we are special, mm -hmm. you know. And that happens across religions, and that is a very dangerous thing. You know, uh, Mr. Dean, the Reverend spoke about uh, interpretation and radicalization, and that's something that is very, very relevant to Islam all around the world. Because, um, you know, radical Islam is something that the world is facing, something that even Islam, uh, Islamic, uh, the Islamic community around the world is grappling with. So whenever the radicalism is mentioned, it's always in the same breath as the word jihad, or the concept of jihad. So can you explain where Islamic fundamentalism comes from and how it's related to jihad? For someone who uh, has heard it before but they don't know exactly what it is, how would you explain it? Okay, jihad is an Arabic word. All right. It literally means to struggle, to struggle against injustice, to struggle against one's own in personal inclinations, and is there for a reason f to, to, to uplift you spiritually. That's the major uh, contention over there. That, uh, that's what actually jihad stands for, which is also called the greater jihad. Uh, it's not my word, but the word of our Holy Prophet. Uh, is an interesting uh, incident. Uh, it's in his, one of his uh, hadith uh, in, in, in his uh, traditions uh, that uh, I think, I believe, uh, it's uh, narrated by uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah, uh, that uh, in one of the instances when uh, some uh, uh, sahaba, the companions, they came back from a particular battle, then the Prophet, he asked them, now that you have come from a lesser jihad, now you have to face a greater jihad. So the companions were amazed. Oh, oh, yeah, oh Prophet, oh, what is this greater jihad that you're talking about? Then the Prophet says, to strive against your own personal inclinations. So that w he, was, he was very specific and it was very much clear. I mean, uh, this whole point about, about, about this holy war, there's no holy war in, in Islam. 
there's no particular word for it. I mean, if you translate it in, in, in Arabic, it would be al-harb al-muqaddas, which is actually foreign to Islam. It was never used in the, in the, in the, in the classical times. Right? So that particular word is foreign. The thing over here is that it has three d dimensions. Jihad has three specific dimensions. The one I told you, that it's, it's, it's for uh, internal uplifting, right? It's for spiritual purposes, to, to, to become a better human being, to do something good, I mean, for, for, for yourself, to, to improve on yourself, right? And then the second is to create justice, equality uh, in, in, the, uh, in the community that you're living in. And then the third is actually exceptional, which is the combative form of jihad. Now, that has been misconstrued, misinterpreted numerous times, right? Those times, uh, whatever uh, 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 situation they faced uh, in the early uh, days of Islam, right, they were constantly under attack from the, from the Quraysh, right? So they had to uh, uh, do something about it. But, but, but having said that, for the first 13 years when, he, when the Prophet stayed in Medina, uh, in, in Mecca, there was no jihad at all. I mean, combative form of jihad. Whatever jihad they did was internally for so for 13 years they actually uh, 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 were patient with whatever persecution they, they faced they were I mean they, they, they stood there all right they stood the ground and in, in one of the instances they even uh, he, he even allowed some of the companions to migrate to Abyssinia to Ethiopia right uh, where the king Najashi Najash was, was there he, he, he was a Christian king and the prophet said that he's a just king go to him and he'll give you protection and he did. So, I mean, this is an, uh, uh, this is an exceptional circumstance. You, you can see that the prophets is actually, I mean, when people say that, hey, Islam is, doesn't, doesn't deal with other faiths, here's the example set by the prophet himself. So that's why I said, when you have to talk about religion, you, you talk about the origin of scriptures, you talk about history, what actually happened over there, not, not the actions of, 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 of a few Muslims, and that cannot be a justification to put it on entire 1.8 billion Muslims around the globe that, hey, this is what Islam speaks of, and these are what the Muslims are, are portraying. No, that is not the case at all. Thank you. We'll be right back after a break. Welcome back. We're now joined by Mr. Prasad from the University of the South Pacific. Thank you for having me here. So one of the, th uh, the outcomes of Christchurch, especially for us as Fijians, mm. is that we're now able to sit and have a civil talk about religious indifference in this country, something that's always been sort of, you know, mentioned uh, under the covers. And we've had people on the show, especially politicians, who have brushed the subject aside saying, oh, there's, there's really no issue here. Exactly. Uh, from mm -hmm. the work that you do in your community, do you think that we, we do have a problem with Islamophobia, uh, with, generally with color in Fiji? Uh, definitely, yes. Yeah, we, have, we have seen that happening uh, for a couple of years now. And... Uh, what has happened in Christchurch has, uh, has really awakened. Maybe we never expected such things to happen. We hear it happening all over the world, but now it's close to us. And in fact, some of our own people were involved has really uh, evoked that humanity in each and every one. While that is good, I would like to see that the communities, whatever we are doing now, these vigils and other, is sustained in a longer way, and we are openly talking about it. Yes, there is an issue. We need to talk. And as you said previously, politicians have come and said, and uh, from the Hindu perspective, uh, Hindu religion, Hindu religion is a way of life. And uh, the Hindu religion is based on the four Vedas. A and the Vedas, the Rig Veda, the oldest one says, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudi Vedanti, which means there's only one and only one. And sages and learned ones interpret that in many different ways. So the basic idea of Hinduism is, of course, that uh, there is only one truth. And le sages and learned people interpret it. As I was listening, uh, it depends on how people interpret their texts. And people will do it because of their background, how they are brought up in their homes, and the environment they are exposed to, the media, the social media. And what we actually need to do is the current generation, the generations to come, is that we need to train them to be critical thinkers better consumers of information 
right? And then how they interpret the religious text. As I said, it starts right from the home. There's another shlok in Hindu dharma which says Vasudevam, uh, Vasudevam uh, Ekalavam. And that means the whole world is one big family. Vasudevam Kutukam. Vasudevam means earth and Kutukam means family. So the whole world is a family. And in all the Hindu scriptures, there's no space for hatred as it's one of the oldest religions of the world. We all know that. In all the scriptures, even the term used to refer to people is never Hindu, it's humans. But it's hmm. interesting that you say that. Uh, it's undeniable that there is a, a, a latent intolerance between everyday Hindus and Muslims. Yes, definitely. The, how do we move forward in this day and age given acts of terrorism right on our doorstep affecting us yes. because we are such a tight-knit community? Definitely. Uh, Fiji, Fiji is unique in that case and, and these two particular communities, mm -hmm. you know, till a certain time there was never a feeling that I am a Hindu and he is a Muslim. It's rather unfortunate that the politics of race has played a big part in our life and, and the fact is that it affects everybody mm -hmm. and people form opinions. Mm -hmm. But the good part is that majority mm -hmm. of the Fiji Indians mm -hmm. still do not participate in that kind of rhetoric and they still, if you go to any village, anywhere, mm -hmm. there is hardly any kind of uh, ill feeling or any kind mm -hmm. of, uh, but we need to celebrate that fact and we need to inculcate that in mm -hmm. our children mm -hmm. and, and uh, as I said, make them critical thinkers, especially of this media and social media, mm -hmm. like uh, let's face it, during the elections time, mm -hmm. there was huge amount of this kind of hatred being spilt over. Now, people should understand the common man that that's the job of politicians. Leave it to them. Mm -hmm. We as people on the ground are there. And one of the things like it was the incident which happened in Christchurch, mm -hmm. like one of the victims, even I know him. So it felt like I lost somebody from my family. Mm -hmm. And it has, as I said, uh, by cancelling some holy celebrations and having visits, I don't, uh, it's okay, it's a good gesture, but it has to be in a sustained way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be just because of this incident we are doing this and then the next day we are back to what we were. So there has to be some sustainability and this should be a lesson to be learned. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel, yeah. So Mr. Dean, yeah. how do you move forward in terms of going, sort of washing away all these misconceptions, working together, making sure that at least are, you know, on the ground level, people are aware of each other's ideology so that there is no perpetuation of hate uh, using misinformation? Well, the simple thing to do is to open up, mm -hmm. to be more tolerant in our society mm -hmm. and to accept each other uh, regardless of our ethnic background, our religious background or whatever. I mean, we are all humans. At the end of the day, we are, we all, we all descended from Adam. Right. So we are all, like Brother Rajan said, that we are all one big family. So we have to celebrate that fact. The more we try to succumb, or you, or we let ourselves to succumb to those uh, particular agendas that are at play in the international media or in politics or whatever things that is actually uh, convincing our minds and, 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 and influencing the, uh, the younger generation who are, who are, who are hooked on to our uh, um, these, these small smart devices, smart devices and uh, stuff like that and, and then mm -hmm. so social media. You have to, like you said, you have to be critical thinkers. You have to evaluate, assess things, all the information that's, that's been fed to you, you have to assess those things and, and, and set yourselves right. I mean, the, 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 uh, the Islamic concept of, of jihad, like uh, in, in, the, in the previous segment, uh, it all starts from, from yourself, from, from within, that you strive to become better. Mm -hmm. That's the whole, I believe all the major religions in, in the world, all the major religions, Islam inclusive of it, that these religions, they came to, 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 to uh, regulate the human conduct, but in, in essence, it was there to make each and every one better human beings. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the main force behind it. And whatever radicalization and, and these things are, are going on in the minds of the, not just the Muslims, but I mean, there's these radical elements now in the non-Muslim who are, who, are, who are taking up, you know, weapons and, and, and trying to individually uh, 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 justify their acts. It's simply uh, unacceptable and it's all because of that rhetoric which actually uh, gave way to all these actions in place. So all those rhetoric actually has to be condemned in the most harshest manner and the government should also implement uh, certain laws, I mean to ban even on the social media like our Prime Minister so that we need to speak up uh, against, against racism and, and hate speech because this is actually how it starts and this is how it ends. Whatever happened over there in Christchurch could happen anywhere. I mean, it was in, it was said that New Zealand was the most peaceful country on on, on Earth, mm -hmm. right? So if it could happen there, it could happen anywhere. So what we need to do is put a uh, a stop to 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 institutionalize bigotry mm -hmm. that is giving way. I mean, from international uh, media, from international politics, which is also affecting our our way of life, our simple Pacific way of life. We should keep it Pacific. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're now joined by Mr. Raj of the Human Rights Commission. Now, any reasonable person will agree that the underlying reason behind the uh, Christchurch incident was extremism. What are your thoughts on extremism? The, it, it's, it's a growing thing in the world, isn't it? Well, more than ever, I think particularly with the advent of the tragedy that transpired in Christchurch, it's compelled everybody in the world to really reevaluate and think about the values of tolerance, multiculturalism, the principles of non-discrimination, uh, the place of fundamental human rights and freedoms, the place of peace, um, and also reevaluate who's a terrorist. I think part of the problem with discussions around terrorism is that there is a certain kind of stereotype. Uh, and, and, and that prevailing stereotype gets reproduced every time we discuss that. For instance, every time there's a discussion about a terrorist, we try and interrogate a Muslim. And then we get into a, 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 an exegesis on what the Holy Quran contains. And I think that kind of discussion just has the effect of reproducing the stereotypes about a Muslim being a terrorist. And we banalize those kind of... Um, you know, stereotypes, to an extent that they become facts. Mm -hmm. But what the Christchurch, um, you know, tragedy has, you know, compelled us to think through is that a terrorist is somebody who harbors hate, and somebody who harbors hate knows no boundaries when it comes to religion, mm -hmm. has no specific color, has no specific race, uh, is not confined to geographical boundaries, I mean, if you look at it, um, you know, uh, this person, uh, you know, destroyed lives in the sanctity of a mosque. Mm -hmm. It happened in New Zealand, which is, you know, one of the most peace-loving countries you could have never probably thought. And most importantly, it's taken the lives of three Fijians. We never, ever, ever thought that, you know, ordin ordinary Fijians would be embroiled in, 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 in a, something so catastrophic that is associated with terrorism and extremism and hate and all of that. Which is why I think it's important that we in Fiji realize that our lives are inextricably woven into the fabric of what's happening globally. Mm -hmm. And there's a global tirade of intolerance, of hate, um, uh, premised on this internalized fear that people have, these phobias, I mean, the term is, you know, Islamophobia. Islamophobia. But, you know, you have all kinds of phobias, which is, yeah. which is you know, th this, 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 this hatred that people innately have for difference mm -hmm. because you're not the same as I am. Mm -hmm. You represent values that are not my values and all of that. So more than ever, we need to start thinking about the antecedents of some of this. If you look at what's happening globally, um, the, 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 um, the rampant xenophobia that is associated with immigration, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, uh, what's happening in terms of the rise of you know, right-wing political parties. Mm -hmm. You look at the rhetoric of our politicians in parliaments and elsewhere, you know, they really need to reevaluate that rhetoric uh, in terms of the, the temperature and the ways in which the media then exploits all of that. 
I mean, I'm I'm moved by the fact that we have now galvanized our efforts in this country. Mm -hmm. People have come out and spoken out against the state of opprobrium that we find ourselves in. We must be speaking out against racial and religious uh, you know, intolerance at all times. We must stand up against hate speeches. Mm -hmm. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's a lugubrious consolation precisely because it took the lives of 50 people for people here to realize mm -hmm. that we must be speaking out mm -hmm. against hate speeches mm -hmm. at all times. And I'm sorry to say this, but the reality is that, you know, we've been speaking out against hate speeches for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But politicians have shot us down time and time again to say, this is an infriction on the right to freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. No right to freedom of expression gives you the right to promote and propagate hate to an extent that it descends into this because ultimately you lose lives. We've seen what happens when hate speech goes unchecked, mm -hmm. right? And, and we know that because of the advent of the social media, there are no boundaries. I'm pretty sure New Zealand, you know, as a country, is, is very multicultural. Um, you know, it's got a strong ethos of multiculturalism, of tolerance, um, and we're seeing that in terms of the how tenacious their people are, the, the various gestures that, you know, people from different faith and, and communities have, have shown the sense of solidarity towards what has transpired. But the fact that this could happen in a country like New Zealand means mm -hmm. that, you know, we need to start thinking about the, the forces of the social media. The, 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 the place of, you know, uh, 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 you know, instruments of terror. For instance, you know, the presence of weapons mm -hmm. and arms and all of that. We have to count our blessings in this country that nobody can walk into a shop and exactly. buy a weapon. Mm -hmm. We need to count our blessings. Mm -hmm. There are things we are doing right. But there are things that we also need to start thinking about. Are we entering the protocols of other people? Are we trying to understand where the other culture the, their religious values, where that human being is coming from. Mm -hmm. And people talk about the fact that, you know, terrorism flourishes when there is injustice. But how do we think about injustice? And who is the subject of injustice? Mm -hmm. And what is the blueprint for social justice? Is the blueprint for social justice taking more lives away? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's where we need to go. We need right. to deconstruct who a terrorist is, what are the antecedents of hate. Uh, Mr. Prasad, very quickly, mm. the perpetuation of extremism. Do you, do you share Mr. Ashwin's I, I totally agree with Mr. Raj, whatever he has said. And yes, terrorism does not have a face, race, or culture, or creed. And we should not ever define it to a particular religion. And as he said, the minute we start asking, let, let, after this uh, Christchurch incident, a lot of people are going to the Islamic Institute and Islamic leaders and asking them, but why are we doing that? Why can't we ask any common person mm -hmm. the reasons for this? Why, why are we uh, targeting a particular person or a particular caste or creed or race? And that's where, as he said, that uh, and we said, the stereotyping starts happening. Mm -hmm. Remember that person, I, I love the way the Prime Minister of New Zealand said, I will never name this person. Mm -hmm. No, because he's just a person who destroyed humanity. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the treatment he should get. So by defining things according to caste, creed and culture, we are actually enhancing that kind of thought, which mm -hmm. should not be happening. Mm -hmm. We should look at the human community. And as he said, unfortunately, the, the politicians, the, the leaders have sometimes for their own benefit or for their own, and we know the nature of their work, have said things, not only in Fiji, but all over the world. But uh, they should realize these NGOs, these religious groups, these uh, politicians, apart from their rights and whatever they have, they have a social responsibility. Mm -hmm. There are people there who look up to you. Mm -hmm. The minute you utter a word or a sentence depicting somebody or some, you realize you have fan followers who will take your word mm -hmm. as yeah. the correct word. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of social responsibility on all religious groups, on all leaders, regardless of which group they are, and politicians or anybody, that when we say things like this, we should never pinpoint a particular religion, caste or creed, but mm -hmm. talk about it as an enemy of humanity. And that's how we should look at it. Well, nobody should be an enemy. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Nobody should we be. We should not mm. be thinking who's the citizan, who's the territory. Right. Exactly. Nobody is an outsider. Mm. That's mm. part of the Thank problem. You, gentlemen. Yeah. We'll have more for you right after the break.
Welcome back. Mr. Raj, let's talk solutions. Yes. How do we ensure that we're not just sitting in this room raising the issues and not actually finding no, solutions? No, absolutely. And I think the most important antidote to hate speech is more speech. More speech that begins to expose to the world the evils of hate speech. What is the cost of hate speech to our humanity? Um, and, and when I say more speech, more speech also in terms of speech act, that begins to deconstruct, debunk, denaturalize various stereotypes about communities. And that's where the media plays a fundamental role in terms of and, 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 you know, a forceful you know, instrument that produces certain regimes of representation. I give you an example because of the tragedy in New Zealand, we very much caught you know, with, with Muslims and, and who's a terrorist and all of that. Uh, just here, you know, uh, two, three weeks ago, there was the unfortunate sort of, you know, incident of a 14-year-old a, a child who was allegedly, uh, you know, ab uh, abducted. And uh, the next thing you know, the media had a big story, it's the Chinese who did it. Mm -hmm. We should stop profiling. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because that's how it all starts. It starts with a certain kind of generalization about a particular community that then, you know, begins to sort of do the rounds. Uh, you know, in various circles, either aided and abetted by politicians, and also, um, you know, uh, armchair critics, keyboard warriors, all of that. And before you know it, hate is beginning to crystallize itself. Mm -hmm. And you really sit people down and you ask them, why do you have contempt for this community or this individual? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so how is it that you don't know? And how did you become a passive, um, you know, um, intermediary mm -hmm. for this kind of hate? So that's the first thing. The second thing is, more than ever, I think the media needs to start talking, talking about ethics. Mm -hmm. mm. In this world where hate has become a big problem, you need to develop an ethical political sensibility that begins to look at peace rather than crisis. Because crisis sells for the media. Anything which is sensationalist, anything which looks at differences is a good thing because it sells. But look at the damage it's doing to human beings and our social fabric. So that's the second thing. The third thing is that the state has a positive obligation to protect people against hate speeches. Mm -hmm. That is explicitly, um, you know, written down in our constitution. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, hate, uh, any propagation of hate on premise on prohibited grounds of discrimination prescribed under Section 26. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, and so it's not just race or religion. There's, it's, it's, it's a whole, uh, you know, plethora. Of, of, you know, things around gender, sexual orientation, so on and so forth. Uh, the other thing is um, we need to move away from that kind of, you know, uh, thing that if we are speaking out against hate speeches, we're taking away people's right to freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. Can people who are unabashedly, uh, you know, who are unabashed proponents of freedom of expression say to me that people who have lost their lives, do you not think that people who have lost their lives have ultimately lost their voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much for freedom of expression. Hate produces a chilling effect on freedom of expression. And this country needs to learn that. I know politicians and NGOs hate me for the stance that I took, you know, very many years ago. Mm -hmm. When the conversation about water and kerosene started, I said, this is going to lead to hate speech. It's descending into that. You look at the rhetoric around elections and all of that. What was mm. happening in our social media? Mm. We don't just have Islamophobia in our social mm -hmm. media. We've got misogyny. We've got people who really hate women. Mm -hmm. mm. We've got people who are homophobes. You know, there's no tolerance for LBGTI community. Mm. So if you look at it, it's, it's the ways in which, you know, various forms of hate and, you know, zero tolerance for diversity intersect, mm. right? So we need to start thinking about what is the state's obligation? How do we now think about self-regulation of the social media? Right? What about the, the, the role of technology in all of it? Mm -hmm. Can they create algorithms that detect hate speech? Mm -hmm. right? And how do they then deal with the problem of the vernacular? Because a lot of the hate in the world today mm -hmm. is expressed in our mother tongue, in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's not an easy task. But I'm so glad that, you know, the FBC decided to have this conversation mm -hmm. because this is the kind of conversation this country should be having. Robust 
intelligent discussion right. that is free of politics mm -hmm. because the cost is the cost that we've seen mm -hmm. in New mm -hmm. Zealand and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I understand in Philippines there's been shootings, you know, in, in church. Mm -hmm. So look, no religion is safe. No particular community is a victim. No particular community is a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. We need to rise above the blame game mm -hmm. and start looking at the ways in which, you know, perhaps we, you know, wittingly or otherwise, are playing a part mm -hmm. in giving credence to stereotypes right. and hate. Mm -hmm. So please, have a look at your own sense of responsibility mm -hmm. as you engage in a democracy. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and we certainly hope that this is um, uh, the first of many other conversations, uh, civil conversations that we can have Absolutely. around some of the issues that have always concerned us as PGNs. But thank you for joining us and that's all we have for you tonight. Join us next week. Good evening.